All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Region Civics Incubator. So I've been asked, you know, all right, time out, what's going on here? It's like drinking from a fire hose. And I know the first season has been a little bit intense as we try to figure out our pattern and our rhythm of how to, you know, convey the wealth and depth of information we're trying to convey here and help us design our project. So I wanted to start this off with a little bit of context grounding where we're at on our journey and what we can expect next. So all of the projects of this season, everyone represented here today, you all showed up already with an established project. You had a pretty good idea of what you were co-creating. You already had a vision in mind, where it was, where it's at, et cetera. So that's step for most projects for them to go through. You guys have already been through for however many years. Um, so you kind of joined at that stage of the journey anyway. So when you came to us, we dropped in and we we're like, okay, so how do you create? You know, what is that game guide? So that's what we first started off with, right? Is that understanding of when people show up to your project, because that's what we're trying to do, grow a project, we need people to do that. You know, how do they create with you? So that was the first questions we kind of covered. And then we showed an ecosystem map or a mastermind, whatever you want to call it. Um, Nico demonstrated his for his project. That's something that's going to unfold over time, but that's another one of those patterns. And then of course the project guide. And then what we've been talking about recently is then tokenomics. So token economics, tokenomics is just token economics smashed together, but really it's just the project economics more broadly. Like, so how does your project distribute value, make decisions, coordinate resources to accomplish shared tasks? You know, that general pattern of what you're creating and how you're creating it, right? So that's where we're at still today. And then after we've decided what we're trying to build, <laughs> which is all these first questions, then we'll decide the legal container to put it around. So we'll understand what right, what's right for us. Maybe you guys already have one. Fine, we'll answer those questions there. Then right after that, we'll go ahead and set up our DAOs. So we'll actually establish the circle structure, the roles. We'll figure out what roles are. Um, and we'll start having all of our episodes and sessions kind of around the process of setting up your organization and getting it ready to accept new members. And then after that's the crowd pooling. So that's when the event is where we have our token design and it's, we have the legal container. We're ready to accept people. We're ready to say, hey world, this is what we're up to. You know, come bring all the nine forms of capital that we're accepting. And then after that, we'll dive more into the governance process itself because that's what's gonna be most alive when everyone shows up into these new organizations. All of these governance questions are gonna start coming up and be really alive in our communities. Great, so that's when the incubator will then start diving into the governance process. And that's an ongoing game. And what I think will be really awesome is if the 13 projects here, you guys keep creating together. You know, maybe you just make this a weekly session that you guys have, you know, for however many years you need to until you guys figure out that you really have a good flow in your community. And maybe we can just find that these could be really valuable in our communities as we keep learning how to, you know, create the games that we're playing, right? Um, so anyway, so that's kind of like the big map, trying to help ground where we're at, put us into context. I wanted to pause here in case anyone's still confused, feeling like, whoa, what's going on here? Or if anyone has any general questions around what we're doing before we drop in today's session. <laughs> Was that helpful? Hey, are we all on the same right? page? Thanks. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, yeah, we are. That looks good. That's very helpful. I was wondering, so is the trajectory about something like the coming two months for the rest? Are you are you going to sort of spend uh, two weeks on one topic or that's? I have no idea. Part of season one was trying to figure out how long it took us. Um, and I'm sitting here as a facilitator trying to balance the two forces of one group saying like, hey, we're moving too fast. The other group saying, hey, we're moving too slow. So, you know, I'm trying to find that nice rhythm where I'm delivering the information I think is necessary and then leaving it up to each project to kind of go at whatever pace they want to. So some projects might feel like, whoa, this is too much. Well, maybe that means that you're a less mature project than maybe you thought you were. Um, because maybe you think you're trying to skip steps, at least in my opinion, I think these steps are vital. Um, so anyway, that's, it's, it's weird because I think we got 13 projects who were at a different phase of the game, and maybe we didn't take the same speed that projects were wanting to go on. So I think future seasons will also take that into account. Rather than just where a project is in its journey, we also need to know what speed you want to go at in order to know if you're going to make sense in the cohort or not. Otherwise, we keep having this kind of, um, anyway, you guys get it. 
so I don't, I don't know. I think we're figuring that out right now, real time. So I'm adjusting to this feedback. I'm trying to bring more context. Um, and I think we can shift the, the process that we're going through right now so that groups can kind of go at their own pace. So I'm going to do a better job of delivering the whole map of where we want to go. And then you can skip ahead. So for example, groups can be launching their DAOs right now. If you already have a pretty good idea of what you want to do, how your economics are going to work, your legal container, you've already decided that, then you can launch your DAO right now. And you can start filling out roles and getting people to be coming into your DAO already. Like, great. And some projects are starting to do that. And Regen Civics is doing that too. Um, so you can move ahead faster if you want to launch. So here, I'll show you this map one more time. Um, so if you do want to get to that crowd pooling place quicker and you already, again, have that idea of the legal container you want or it's already set up, then I'd say start your DAO right now. Start putting out empty roles into it. And I can show you, actually, I can show you right now. Never mind. I'll show you in another episode, uh, the next one, how to actually do that. Um, and then you can start setting up your organization and getting ready for that crowd pooling event. Because remember, the crowd pooling isn't just for selling tokens for money. I mean, that's that's crowdfunding. That's less interesting. What is a little bit more interesting is you could say these are the roles that we need in our village and project in order to succeed. So then people who want to contribute to your project and don't have extra money to invest all of a sudden can which is a huge part of the world's population that want to be part of these transition projects or people who aren't necessarily going to show up with money. And that's fine because our projects needs a heck of a lot more than just money. In fact, money is oftentimes, you know, a false intermediary. We think we need money in order to succeed, but then we just run into these exact same questions. Now we have 10 million in the you know, bank account to pay people, but you're still going to figure out how you're going to go through organizing yourself, accepting new members, going through a membership process, et cetera. You know, now people are just motivated by money rather than just the shared vision that you're creating. Um, so I think that's what the whole crowd pooling moment is. So I think that's why it's vital for us actually to have an understanding of what our structure is, how people can show up, how our value flow is equitable, et cetera, you know, before having this event. Um, so I think if you want to just raise money with tokens, maybe this incubator isn't really the best thing for you because there's a billion other platforms and projects that you can just go and do that. And then maybe this process isn't really, you know, what you're here to do. <laughs> um, this is a little bit different, um, if that's helpful. Did that help at all, Roberto or Robert? Um, any other questions about where we're going and what we're doing before we dive in? Or any other announcements or anything that people wanted to share? Because <laughs> I know we just kind of kicked it off today without opening it up. So does anyone have any announcements or any other big questions or items they wanted to bring to the group before we get started today? Will. Um, yeah, hello. I was just curious, you said that if you're in a position with a legal container and tokenomics uh, kind of nailed in or at least somewhat a good idea of it, then to, to start the DAO, to launch the DHO now, we have the Universal Land Trust DHO for the Alliance, but not a Starseed DHO for the project. So how do we how do we start one? How do we start filling it out with our roles and our responsibilities? And yeah, how do we start programming the specific Starseed DHO? Um. Great. So I think what I'm hearing, and I've been hearing this a couple of different places, is that next episode is going to be on the do itself and how to go through launching one, setting it up, and then I'll literally walk through the process of doing it with Regen Civics and our do, and show you all how to do that with your projects. And then we'll talk a little bit more about roles and circles and structure of our organizations and all that stuff. Um, I have that plan for next session, and I think that makes sense. But today, it's still, we're going to dive a little bit more into tokenomics and focus on those questions. Because to fully answer your question, okay, thank the whole you. session, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah other... it was more a case of like, is there, we can just start with, like, if, do we have a link to a star CDHO that we can start programming? Or if we can wait till next week, no problem. I put an announcement forever ago. It's in the Haifa Discord. Oh, sorry, it's in Discord under the Haifa region. I'll, I'll tag everyone again in the Region Civics Discord. 
And there was links for you to fill out in order to set up your DAO and be part of the... Yeah, anyway, I'll find it after. And I'll share it again in the announcement channel in Regent Civics for every group to go and fill out these forms in order to launch their dues. And it's like the name of your token, um, who's going to be your launch team. So you're going to have to have that set up. Um, if you want your token to have a max supply or not, you're going to need to know that. So part of this tokenomics session is going to be able to be helpful for you when you go to launch your token. Cool. Um, Anders. Uh, is it so it, it feels like a good idea then for me at least i don't know how it's all going to be set up and so i could go set up my DAO, but since i don't really have all the knowledge that i want it seems like it would be more in alignment to listen to this this section the next sections and then you know and start kind of penciling things out before i set up the DAO. or you know is that something that could be set up before some of these things are dialed um, well, that's what I was just saying to answer the question on speed. So if people are wanting to go now, then yeah, you can. You can go and launch your do, fill out those forms and get one set up. Um, if you want to go at the pace of the accelerator, then I'm seeing us do that in the next you know, three or four episodes is when we really start filling out our DAO. So within the next month, we have our DAO launched um, and we're starting to fill it out. And we have a lot of questions on how to fill it out, right? You know, what are those first policies? What are the first roles? You know, what's our circle or, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, which we'll get into in those episodes. So this is when you really start thinking about what is the structure of the project itself you know, do we have a food circle that's responsible for growing food abundantly for the community or not? You know, what does that actually mean? You know, that type of stuff and how do you structure, you know, membership and roles and where people actually show up? Um, all of that stuff we'll kind of dive into. Um, and it kind of weaves into tokenomics. That's why I think launching the DAO is after you've considered both. You know, you design your token from the perspective of, Actually, I can just dive into that today. Is there any other questions before I dive into tokenomics and what we're doing here? Did that answer your question at all, Anders? Cool. Great, thanks. And the diagram is super helpful. And maybe we can also work on laying it in a, a timeline type of a situation um, over time. So keep developing these tools, thanks. Yep, absolutely. And I'm building this out in slides right now, but the intention is for us to actually put this into the UI um, of the DAO launcher itself. So future projects literally go through what we're designing here real time and more of a click your way through a UI, build your game adventure style. Um, a little bit, bit more fun, but hey, we're kind of paving the way here. So bear with us. Um, all right, so I'll go back to sharing screen here. And if any of the projects have some of their tokenomics mapped out and they wanna share with the group what they have and get feedback from us. And I can give you feedback real time here. Great, that could be the second half of today's session. So if you do have something like that, maybe you can prepare it if you'd like. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna help ground all of this here today um, by walking you through one community and their journey, their fake journey through setting up their token and what they actually do. So this is what I'm calling the village builder or the village creator game. Um, this is what I'd like to build into a UI someday where people literally click through this and help them design their villages as a project. But anyway, so the first question that groups are going to ask when they come together is what do we have? This is something that I think groups don't really you know, do often enough because they don't know how much wealth they already have in their community existing. So this is one exercise to do to start designing your economy is to first take stock of what you have in your economy. Because that's essentially like the main function of an economy itself is to distribute value and coordinate activities and coordinate capital. It's the essential like role in the economy. And how you do that is how your economy is designed. So the very first thing you would want to do is take stock of what's going on in our economy. And these are the different forms of capital you see on the left, you know, what I call the currency. And this is just examples. This is a way of thinking. This isn't perfect. This is something that's emergent too. Um, and then the utility for each form of capital. So then I'd suggest is go through your community and say, okay, how much land do we have already existing in our community? And that would be your natural capital. You know, how much money do we have? 
You know, what's our social networks look like? How much influence do we have? What can we weave in there? You know, what's our intellectual knowledge? Could we already be putting on courses, et cetera? So you kind of take stock of what you have as a community. Um, some of us know this intuitively, but it is a powerful exercise to actually map out. Um, anyway, so we'll keep going. And then one way of mapping this, I've talked about this a lot in previous episodes, um, is to actually go back and track the historical contributions to all of those forms of capital. So if you're saying that you as a community has 100 he hectares of land, okay, how was someone recognized for bringing that 100 hectares of land? So maybe that 100 hectares is worth $100 million. Maybe your token you're saying is representing a dollar value. Great, so you give them 100 million tokens. Um, and here's a spreadsheet to actually walk through how you track and account for all of the types of capital that your project has right now. So that's how you kind of take stock of like, how is our economy? What's the current foundation of it? Who's got what? Have we tracked all historical contributions, et cetera? Um, so that's kind of looking back. And then once you have your foundations, then, and this is all part of kind of the first things you do when you're kind of considering this is, what are we actually doing? So what are you doing as a community? You're coming together to do what? Maybe it's to better meet your needs. And I think that's a very general way that communities can come together. Projects exist to meet needs, right? Okay, so what needs are we actually trying to meet? I think this is a very helpful exercise for groups to actually very explicitly say, these are the needs we're setting out to meet as a project. You know, if businesses today, they said, you know, the only need we're out to meet is to make money. And then it's up to you to use that money to go and, you know, meet all of your other needs. Fine. But we could be setting up organizations that say, you know what, we're actually going to design the organization to meet our need for growth. You know, our need for physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual development. Like, what does it look like if we design organizations explicitly designed to meet that need for its members, right? And then you can extend that, right? So these types of organizations, of course, already exist, but it's starting off and saying, okay, what is our organization designed to do? What needs is it here to meet? And let's make that explicit as a community, because then you can start getting creative about how you go about meeting these needs, right? And then actually calling those needs out, saying, yes, we do have a need for love, which means that we need to design our organization to care about communication and intimacy and interdependence and that sort of thing, right? You know, we have a need for play, so we design that into our organization structures that we can make this explicit. Anyway, I think this is a very powerful exercise for groups to do, to again, take stock of one, with the capital flows, what do you have? And then two, what are you doing? You know, why do you exist? What needs are you here to meet as a community, right? So it's kind of the very basic questions you might ask to help design your economy. Um, questions here, any thoughts, feedback, reflections, or anything before I keep flowing through an example of a community actually doing this? Um, and this is an example of a community actually picking out their needs. This, they made it very explicit and they designed this and said, hey, these are our needs in our community. You know, we have a need for diversity, et cetera. You know, you see your physical needs down here with clean air, organic food, living water, ex, you know, et cetera. But that's just like one part of the real needs graph that our organizations can set out to meet that we, we have, right? Um, Will, you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I've just, you said you have, you have, you're holding space for thoughts. One of my thoughts is how do we value our tokens in something other than dollars? So for example, you could value it in seeds, but then how, how, how can we value seeds in something other than dollars? How do we move away from the dollar as the pegs to say, okay, well, someone's got a hundred million dollars worth of land and we can give a hundred million dollars to uh, dollars worth of token. How do we remove the dollar? That's the question. Ooh, um, that's a great question. It actually aligns with tokenomics because that's the tokenomics design of seeds itself. So what we've been thinking over the last three years is exactly that, is how do we create a stable unit of account? Because if our unit of account is dollars, well, if that's losing 10% of its value every year, then everything we're using to account for is losing value at 10% a year. So all of our accounting is subject to 10% inflation. Well, that's broken. So we needed something more stable to peg value against in order to do all this stuff. And that's where Constant Seeds came from. So Constant Seeds is the new tokenomics that Seeds is launching. And that's been you know three plus years in the design and work right now. Um, but it was actually to meet that question. We came to that point and we said, hey, we're, 
we're making all of these economies and we're pegging it to something. We say your token's worth $1 in value, but that's broken. We're still attached to the dollar. We need to disconnect from that. Well, we can't attach to Bitcoin because that's just the opposite. That's way too, you know, anyway, you guys get it. Um, so that was the tokenomics design of seeds itself. And that's the function it wants to play in our, you know, regenerative economy is that stable unit of account that is truly stable. Yeah. But that's a whole other dialogue. And if you're interested in that at all, just say so in the region discord and we'll send you the latest video that the seeds tokenomics group is working on and coming up with. And I'll share that stuff with you too, Will, because I think that answers your question. Um, yeah, anything else like that before we keep going with the example community? Yeah, Reiki, I could, I'll just throw in on that one. Um, good to see everyone here. And yeah, just very eager to have that conversation on constant seeds and stars. And um, I completely agree with the, the issue there, Will. Um, so yeah. That's a good All point. That. I think we weave that, that in with stars too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That might have to be a side totally. quest session that we have. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, awesome. And Lauren, I think this is going to answer your question that you brought to tokenomics session last week was you gave an example of a community kind of very going through a very practical process of setting this up. So this is going to be an example of that. All right. Um, this was actually written five years ago. I took a screenshot of an article that I was writing for designing a land project called Our Neighbor Good. This was gonna be set up in New Zealand, but the pandemic kind of stopped it. But anyway, they're actually going together and putting together this model and this was me helping do that. So this example was a real life example. Um, <clears throat> cool, so anyway, so there's a group of people, A through a J, get together to establish one of these. You know, they wanna do 15 one hectare homesteads and then one hectare is gonna be 10 apartment style housing complexes to house up to a hundred people. So this is the basic design layout of their land. So it was 16 hectares, oh, sorry, it was 20 hectares in total. And this is how they imagined them planning it out. The one hectare homesteads were going to be like 70% forested anyway. And anyway, so most of this was going to be regenerating and turning back into forest, these properties. But so in this way, this was the basic setup. They had 10 interested parties that were coming together that were gonna be first investing into the land and then they were selecting five more to be able to come in and buy into the property so the, that's kind of the basic structure they reasoned that they needed about five hundred and ten thousand dollars in cash um, to build all the basic infrastructure for the community sites so this wasn't the personal housing this was the community infrastructure so they figured this was the money that we needed to raise in our crowdfunding efforts Um, they wanted to do a, kind of an Ubuntu style community as well, or as contribution accounting. So they had this model where you contribute X number of hours a week. In their case, it was eight hours a week. They figured we'd be able to meet all of their goals as a community. So every member would contribute eight hours a week, and that would give them access to all the community infrastructure. They would give them a share of all of the profits from the community enterprises, um, et cetera. So their community contribution was eight hours a week, and there was a bunch of benefits they got from that. Um, I think you guys can read this. So that's what we call the communal time exchange. It's just words we're putting together, call these whatever you want. Um, so the communal time exchange was eight hour contribution a week. But the upfront, the collaborative capital exchange contract, and I'll explain a little bit more what all those words mean. Um, it was 150K for each member. So in total, if there's 10 parties coming together at 150K, that would bring them 1.5 million. And their target was 510 of that 1.5 million needed to actually be in cash. So the next thing they did was going through the different forms of capital that they were trying to pull together. They came up with their collaborative, collaborative capital exchange contracts. So they probably definitely need a different name for that. But that was the upfront capital that they had to bring in. So you see that member A, oops, member A just came in with 150 cash. That person had a lot of financial resources. They're like, great, I'll just invest the 150. Fine. Um, number B came in with Bitcoin um, for $50,000 worth. 
uh, came in with an expansive seed bank that they had. They knew the community was setting up a lot of forests and doing a lot of regenerative agriculture. Great. So they're able to bring, you know, a lot of value worth of seeds and the, that to the property. And then they figured that they wanted to be a communal permaculturist at 15 hours a week for the next 222 weeks. So they're going to work for the rest of their 150 upfront contribution. Because the basic model that these members came together with is they wanted everyone to be equal. Maybe everyone couldn't be equal up front because not everyone had the 150K cash to come in with. But they wanted a situation where everyone came in with and took the same amount of risks, even if it took them, you know, 222 weeks in order to bring out that balance, right? So this was an upfront agreement that members made when they showed up to the community to say, how are we going to bring an equal value? Well, if you don't have the money, well, maybe you have to make a commitment to show up in a role and bring value to that community. So that's an upfront contribution that they made, right? Um, and then C came in with land and they valued that, et cetera. So you go through and actually track all the different forms of value that your project needs. And then you give a fixed number that well exceeds, in this case, it's three times higher. So they said, we wanna raise 1.5 million in capital, but we only need 500,000 of that to be cash. So it's a really important distinction. You know, a lot of times when we go to set up a project, we turn all of it into cash. They say, we need to raise $10 million, and then we're gonna use all those dollars to buy land and pay people, et cetera. Instead, we're saying, we wanna raise $10 million in capital, but we really only need 1 million of that to be cash, and we can take everything else directly, right? So you can have people actually show up with homesteading equipment and tractors. Maybe you don't need cash to go out and buy a new one. There's a ton of people out there with tractors just sitting there. Maybe they wanna contribute it to a project like this. So this is really what we're trying to unlock with the crowd pooling and the tokens and all of that is really to unlock all of that capital that's out there that wants to show up and contribute to projects like this, but it doesn't necessarily, this just doesn't happen to be money right now. So if all we go out there to say is we're only raising money, then we limit ourselves to only people who have money that are able to drive projects forward, right? Um, so this is how we can design a project a little bit differently to say you can bring all different forms of capital, but everyone's still gonna become an equal. Um, so their basic tokenomics went like this. You needed to stake 150,000 tokens. So you needed to be an equal contributor in order to have stewardship rights to your one hectare of land. So that person that came in with the 150K well, they just bought 150,000 tokens and they stake them. So it's the same function and, you know, and in practice as them coming in and just buying and owning the land. Because as long as they keep those tokens staked forever, then they own the land and they have stewardship rights to that land forever, right? So it's a similar function to selling the land in that sense. But then people again can work their way to becoming a full owner of their property. So that way, and this project put this into their model is they said, we want at least one of our members to be able to come in with no money at all. And I think actually they said 10%. They wanted 10% of their membership to be able to come in and have no financial contribution requirement. And they were actually gonna direct these at um, homeless and orphanages and refugees. And they said, we're gonna take 10% of the project as people you know, coming from those situations. And they can be able to come in and set up their collaborative capital exchange contract to be able to become an equal member over time as well. And maybe they don't have any, you know, intellectual skills because of whatever situation they're found in. Maybe they're a child, whatever it is. If they're a child, you probably don't have to have them work. So scratch that from my examples. Um, but either way, you can have it so that they come in and part of what they're doing is um, internshipping with other people who are part of the project. So you can set up an internship process as well, where people can come in with, you know, no other types of capital other than just their time and still be able to valuably contribute to the project. Um, so that was something that they baked in. And I just wanted to share that idea because I think it's really powerful. So that was the upfront capital, as they said. And even if it's going to take them, you know, 15 hours a week over 220 weeks, it's still part of the upfront contribution to make that 150K. And then if after X years, they haven't ever been able to stake their tokens and earn them yet, then maybe you can revoke their stewardship right to the land, et cetera. Um, and then on the other side is they have to burn. Um, I think it's more than eight. Those aren't equal. So I just put this together before the call today. So this wouldn't be eight tokens, but anyway, burn a set number of tokens each week in order to stay at the project and continue accessing all of the communal 
um, value that's being presented to the project. So maybe you guys have sharing libraries and people have access to tools and equipment. Maybe you have community centers, et cetera, that people have communal access to. Maybe you have shared enterprises, whatever it is. Like in order to continue getting access to that, then you have your, your burn. So you have to burn tokens in order to be able to continue accessing that. So you can either buy those tokens and burn them like the guy above did, or you can work for them. So you can keep being a permaculturist if that's what the community needs. Or most of these projects just have things that need to be done. So we call these a community time exchange right here. And that's just doing some of the stuff that needs to be done. And you have to do you know, three hours of that a week or whatever it is in your community. Um, so this is kind of the basic tokenomics that they set up was, okay, the token is for tracking all of these flows of value. We're going to use a token to track the upfront capital and who's staked value and who's contributed their share. And we're going to use tokens to make sure that people can earn these tokens or burn them to contribute to the project and keep staying here. And that's our basic kind of value flows. I'll pause here because I delivered once again a lot and we'll see if there's any thoughts, questions or whatever on this kind of concept. And we'll just take a moment and let it land then. Cool. Um, then I'll walk into the actual tokenomics of it. So let me take us to our fancy mirror board. So we touched on all of this stuff last week, kind of what powers do our tokens give and all of that stuff. So in their case, they're really setting up a token for access, something to regulate and control access to their project, who has land, who's contributing, um, and set up a bridge and a boundary for other economic systems for people to be able to invest into, et cetera. So just a few of the powers, but there's a lot of other stuff that they could do if they expanded what their token was doing. Um, Cool. So I covered a lot last week when I actually went over what powers do and I kind of really quickly went over this whole flow. Uh, I've only added a little bit since last week and I wanted to talk about that here because we ended it with this. And I think this is a, and a really beautiful thing to make sure we're bringing to light as we start using tokens is what boundary does it make sense to have a token versus where does it not make sense to have a token? And I put together this brief graphic here, you know, feel free to bring in any other kind of ideas that you have into this that might improve it. But generally, where are tokens best suited? Um, where we have marketplace type of dynamics. So if you are trying to, you know, redirect speculation and the surplus generated from speculation, like trading fees, or even the, the fees when you come in and out of your economy, that's a great place for tokens to exist is for being able to capture value when people come in and out of your economy and you're exchanging with other economic systems. I think that's a very powerful place for tokens to you know, exist. And to be able to track those basic contributions to a project. So when you can build that basic foundation where people say, hey, we're equal members in this community, that lays the foundation for a lot more trust to form. Because a lot of projects kind of have well, maybe you're not equal, but anyway, at least people feel that it's equitable. <laughs> I feel like equal is a huge component for some communities, but anyway, the key is that it's equitable, that people feel like as they're showing up, the value that they're bringing is equitably seen and they feel like it's fair. And with those foundations, then a lot more trust can be formed, which gives layers, provides the foundation rather for these other types of coordination to exist. We don't need tokens to intermediate those actions. So I kind of see as tokens as building that foundation that interacts with other ways of organizing, so other economic systems. But then as you get within your economy, then you can start moving more power to roles. And then a role is, you know, we don't have a token for you have to buy and trade. So an example of a role would be a gift-based economy. So what they do is they have an economic system where they have a role for everything their economy needs. They have a role for the you know, the person who's growing food, a role for the person who's taking that food and turning it into food or whatever. They've designed their little micro economy and they have a role for every person who needs to exist within that circular economy. 
And then you have people filling those roles and they just fill their role. And as long as they keep getting voted into their role every end period, maybe it's every year you guys do a ceremony and vote people into roles. Maybe it's every three months, whatever it is. If you're in that role, you just play that role. You provide your gift, you give it for free and you don't have to you know, be concerned with tracking anything in the meantime. So then you can have a role-based economy. And there's a million variations on that. That's just an example of it. But then maybe you move beyond that. And this is like sports teams. You know, sports teams don't need technology to intermediate and coordinate them. They just intuitively know. They've been coordinating together so long that they have an understanding of who's doing what, who's going where. And these are just really well designed, you know, well executed sports teams. You can kind of see this and the magic that forms when a team is coordinating that way. And I think that's something for us to strive towards to say that we probably, you know, if we're doing all of this coordination well, maybe we don't need tools as often to intermediate that coordination um, as we get into smaller groups. So, of course, I think we're going to need tools to coordinate across the globe, so a larger scale. But within our communities, as we get down into smaller groups of people, I think we can have these different ways of coordination. So I only bring this up because I don't think it's successful as if at the tightest group flow that you have, the smallest community, that within every interaction, you guys are pulling out your phone and sending tokens or something to each other. I don't think that's you know the direction we necessarily want to go. So I'm bringing this up because then we're building you know, boundaries for where it makes sense for all of this. So anyway, if you, I know this was a lot to you know, conceptualize at once, but hey, it's right here and you can dive into some of these examples and maybe process this a little bit more. Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to get Roberto or anyone else's thoughts on that, because I, I, a lot of this came up because of those conversations around where it makes sense or not to, for tokens to exist. So I wanted to get some feedback on if this model at all makes sense, if it's intuitive for you guys or what. Yes. Uh, it, yeah. Thanks a lot for this. It's um, it shows a very good direction of thinking because uh, indeed it includes the tokens in a context of where we actually want to go. So I, I like also the question generally smaller. Can we scale this up? So I, I, I think I think it's an interesting perspective if you basically say at the core. There is trust and there is intuition and there is this kind of team play and there is nothing tracked. As we move outwards, we lose the trust. So that's where we actually start to introduce token. And at the very, very edge, that's the market economy, a fiat economy where it's like we don't need each other at all. We just use the fiat and, and that we can trust. Right. So this disintermediation between the community. Uh, and um, and and tokens, I think I think that we should create some processes on how to move from the outward membranes with the tokens into the in, inner membrane, and maybe it could even be a sort of like um, in gauge from your community, like a, an indicator for your community or where your community is at. So are you at zone? five where we're still dealing with you with tokens because up there in zone four we're not right so i think it's an interesting uh, mm -hmm. yeah it's an interesting thing to explore um of course when we are talking about our group of eco villages or or initiatives i want with that i mean for sure we need to have some sort of tokens to move contribution from one place into another place right so maybe tokens can be used to you can track contribution using roles for instance but as you move from your community into another community where you don't have the role how are you going to be valued there or what you did before so i think tokens have that function of transferring information and knowledge across these groups Ooh, i love that so really what we can do is have tokens start again here and then mirror rows knowing intuition on the other side as it goes into another organization, right? So yeah, I guess tokens is kind of like that membrane that helps things move. And tokens could also be you no know, badges, things that you've accomplished. So say you went and took a permaculture design course at one community and you earned the badge for that. 
Well, that badge could then be transferred and maybe other communities recognize that value. So that's an example of a token. And there comes embodied trust with that badge. Oh, I could trust this person to design a permaculture landscape for me because they've earned this badge. So that's a way of like packaging up trust so you can deliver trust from one community to another community. And then they can start the process of building and establishing more trust and moving into the you know, deeper, deeper within the circle, right? So I do see this as a process and there are moments where you move from one to the next. So for tokens, for example, let's say your token is a, a staking token, like that example I gave you, meaning a community needs to obtain and stake 150,000 of these, and then they get access to one hectare of land in perpetuity. Okay, so when you then take those tokens and you stake them, you enter into a role all of, all of a sudden. Now your role is a steward of this land. And your obligations is steward that land and follow what that means in that community because maybe that means that you can't set up smokestacks and if you do that then you can be revoked right or whatever so anyway so that's how you then move so the process of staking then in this context would move you from this boundary into this boundary or if you have roles in your DAO, so tokens are what's being traded in your DAO on secondary markets cool so you have a 10 million people who are trading your token because it's really exciting what you're doing and a lot of people are speculating on it but you only have 50 people who are actually in roles in your community so then the literal process of moving from one boundary to the nether is being voted into a role right so i think this edge right here is where we can use technology to kind of intermediate the boundaries uh, i don't know if technology could ever intermediate these boundaries <laughs> i don't think it even is necessary um, but you can see at uh, different technical points where you move from one boundary to another here, right? Um, cool. So with that foundation, then we can actually get into some more token flow. So I just really quickly went over this flow chart for token design last week. And I wanted to kind of do it a little bit more today and talk about the structure styles and then open it up for any projects to share about your guys' thoughts and economies or anything like that and where it might fit into this flowchart and help you design your token. Okay, so that example project I showed you, their token is a combination of a Kins domain token and a community contribution token. I call Kins domain, meaning you have stewardship of this particular piece of land if you have n number of tokens staked. So stake per percentage of the tokens, have a percentage of the land that's yours in perpetuity, right? Uh, so I call that a, a Kins domain token. And then a community contribution token. So this is a one that you need to keep contributing to the community in order to have access to community services and community you know, functions, right? So whether that's building or equipment or whatever it is. So it's kind of both of those things put together. So then where are tokens being issued for? So you come down here and track supply when new assets are required. So if you obtain 10 more hectares of land, then you can issue more tokens that represent those new hectares of land, right? Or in this case with the community contribution, when new access is created. So again, if your access is you have access to this apartment for the night, then if you build more apartments in your community center, then you can have more um, tokens to represent that new value that you created. You might actually not need to create new tokens in that sense, because then the value of all your old tokens could just go up when you create new um, value like that. But anyway, you could. You could increase your tokens to represent those new assets. And then to reciprocate contributions. So as people are showing up and adding value, and then new capital is coming into the project. So both of these are really just contributions. I just felt like writing them out in order to just make things really obvious and clear. Um, but then just to reciprocate any type of contributions to the project that are considered valuable, then you would issue new tokens to create those. So then what you're trying to balance then is you can't just issue tokens indefinitely. I mean, you can, but that might be irresponsible. So you're issuing tokens if your demand is also growing. And if that's happening, then the value of your token is going to remain stable. So if more people are buying, showing up to buy your token, then you're creating tokens then the price is going to go up because now you have more demand than you have supply. So it's kind of the very basic economic dynamics here, right? I mean, of course, these get really complicated and there's a lot of ways you can play with them, but that's the basic thought process here is we're not issuing more tokens than we're creating demand for our tokens. 
So just in very basic example, what creates demand for a token? Well, maybe storytelling around that token. No one's going to buy your token if no one knows about it. So someone showing up and creating a video to talk about your project and token, well, that's considered a contribution. So that's valuable and that drives the demand for your token. You know, no one's going to buy your token if they have nowhere to stay. So everything related to, you know, providing a place to stay or providing a function for your token, if it's not just for staying, that's just the one example. Um, then, of course, you're driving demand so you can create more tokens to meet that new demand, right? So that's kind of why you want to think, okay, is it a contribution? It's a contribution if it's valuable for the community, which is going to drive more demand for the token. Um, and that could be valuable for the community. Again, spiritual capital, because maybe people are coming to your project and they're willing to pay, you know, outrageous prices because of the spiritual capital they're going to get there. And we see this today where, you know, some gurus can charge $10,000 an hour to go and talk with them because they have so much spiritual capital, whatever it is, right? So I use that example because, again, people downplay that form of capital. But I think it's very valuable that every form of capital could be seen here because each form can drive demand for your token especially if we design this well. Um, all right, so that's a lot. <laughs> so I'll pause here again to talk about the different structure styles. If anyone has an example of a structure in their community, particular token model, and they would like me to walk through this flow chart with them, I'm happy to do that. Um, or any questions, thoughts, or anything, we can just discuss for the rest of this session. I have a very quick question. Is it, I, I'm still new to Miro. And so when I go to the link to the Miro board and I try to find this, I have a hard time finding this diagram. Is there a way to either extract this or uh, send a link to this particular section so we could come right here? Cause I found this to be so valuable and I tried to find it during the week to show other people on the team. I was like, ah, I can't find it. Um. I'll figure out how, because I'm thinking if I take an image of it, it's going to be too big, and then you'll have to like zoom into the image. So anyway, I'll try to figure out how I might be able to share this otherwise. Um, yeah. In Miro, you, you can make different frames, and then you can have a link just to that frame. Yeah, like Nadine put a link in the chat earlier, and it says move to widget, and it's got a thing. I was like, oh, that's cool. So I, I'm, again, new to, to Miro. But I guess we can come back to that later. Yeah, I can I can show whoever wants to learn how to do that. Great. Thank you. Um, Lauren, does this help you with your guys' project? Because I know you came with some very simple questions last week, and I'm giving you very complex answers. Is this helpful? Very much so. I think some of the questions we were having had to do with, you know, because because Walter's setting up a, uh, you know, it's it's called a simplified stock company in Ecuador. It's basically like an LLC. And so it's got a set number of shares. And so as we think about, you know, how to structure the distribution, this helps identify when we can add new tokens, you know, when we can create new value and what, you know, some of the functions are. So I just thought this was really brilliant. Yeah. Um I had a hack that I was told. I am not a professor in any way um, of either law or taxes or anything. However, I was told that this is a model that in your private app structure that you just reissue shares that represent whatever the token holdings are every end period. So you could say every year we're going to have an accounting period where whatever the percentages of token holdings are, we're just going to reissue the same shares that we have or redistribute the shares once a year because there's obviously the legal work required to do that and you don't want to do it too often um, to reflect the tokens. And then you can just build that into your company charter that says the board of directors are obligated to do this. You know, you show a link to where the token holdings are and you say we're going to reflect this token holdings every end period and that's part of our roles. You might be able to kind of bridge it that way, but this is stuff I think we can get into with legal because I also think there's some better legal structures that people have been working on in region civics that might make that whole thing invalid or unnecessary. 
Um, so yeah, that's if we go right back to this, because why not? I made it. So legal will be our next big chapter. So the next one I'm going to get into with tokenomics is the final one, which is going over the due and actually launching it and showing you how you can start issuing your tokens and accounting for contributions, et cetera. And then after that, we'll get into legal and designing our legal structures and everything. And then after that, we'll dive back more into the DAOs and help set those up a little bit more before we go crowd pool. Okay. Um, Anders, I got a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to share um, my route, I think, in moving forward with this with regard to our land. Um, so uh, if it's helpful for anybody, uh, I'm never planning on selling my land. I don't ever want it to be sold. I want to regenerate it into like, the nth degree, right? And I think a lot of us are on that same, uh, same page. So with regard to that, um, I'm figuring out what the retail value of, of everything is and then matching that value and having other people that buy the token, you know, that money goes back to the people that have invested in to create that value that exists today. But in the future, it's all based on, um, it's not a specific amount of tokens um, that, that that's going to equate because the, um, the organization holds this land, you know, in, in a way. So it's not directly tied to the land itself. It's tied to the whole entire organism that we're co-creating. Yeah, I think that's, that's a model I'd suggest. It's hard to suggest one right now. It's one that I'm favoring <laughs> is that the tokens just represent the organization. The organization owns the land. But then that does two things. One, I don't, I don't think it's successful if any project ends up selling out. I think success is that, of course, we regenerate, we build these paradise communities, and then we have a network of a new civilization that we've just built. You know, so we don't want to sell. But the selling function is there if it fails. It's just to give that safety net. It's to say these tokens are worth something if this completely collapses. So if for whatever reason we can't achieve our mission, then we turn around and sell everything and we give back the, the proceeds of that sell to the token holders. So that's why I'm saying it's backed by all the land is that if it does fail, that's what's gonna be back to the token holders. But then the real value is then what is that token used for? Because that's just a safety net. That only exists if it collapses, right? So that's not a reason people buy tokens. Otherwise they're all gonna hope the thing fails. That's uh, so you actually have a different function, which might be you need this to access the project or you need this to participate in events or you need this for whatever. I don't want to give all the ideas because that's for us to create here is what functions can we build into the token to create value for it, right? That's part of the game and the exploration that we'll continue having here is all the different stuff we can do with tokens if we want. So then the second function is you should say, if the project collapses, we sell everything off and give the proceeds to the tokens. Cool, so it's backed by the project. But then the other token is used for accessing it. So then the real value of it is the market value of accessing the project. And then that's something you guys are growing together as a community, as your project is greater and bigger, we can accept more people, more people wanna come there, it's more valuable because the forests are more lush and more people, like, et cetera. As we regenerate the land and increase the value of the project itself, the token value goes up with it to reflect that. So that was the base function idea is to attach your token to what? If our token you know, incentive is to grow the value of the token, what do we really want that growing the value of? In this case, it's growing the value of the community, which is exactly what we want in all of its forms. We're making sure we're tracking all nine forms of capital. Great, we're growing that value pool. That's exactly what we want. Let's attach the token to that. So what else do you want to grow in your community? What else do you want to improve, increase? Attach the token value to those things and you might see those things improve, increase, right? Um, so that's kind of the basic function we can do with tokens if the economics is grow the value of them, right? Uh, does that does that help, Anders? So that's what I'm advocating for simplicity is that token model that is that. First, you account for all the contributions. That's how the token's initiated. And then you say, if this project collapses, we're going to pay you back all out the value. So Walter and Susan, you guys have probably 95% of the token holdings. So if the whole thing collapses, then you guys are just going to get 95% of the value of selling the project if it fails or whatever. So then you guys are taking care of in that respect. 
Um, but then if other people want to come and access your project, you say, well, we have a project access token. So who are they going to buy that token from? Well, they're going to buy it from you guys. So as more people want to access the project, you guys have 95% of those tokens, you're going to need to sell them. So this is in the case where one community holder has most of the value of the project to start with. So this might be one landowner giving 20,000 hectares of land or whatever. This creates the process for them to distribute their tokens to everyone else coming in. When people are going to have to acquire those tokens from the landowner. Or more value is being created in the project and you're increasing the number of tokens to represent that value. But in that case, you guys aren't being liquidated because more value exists. A new house is there, a new video about your project was created or whatever it was, right? I know I need to make graphics for this to help land it, but is that helpful <laughs> to kind of like substantiate? So you just start the token off by distributing who owns everything right now, representing history, and then only increase the tokens as more contributions are created, if that makes sense. And then the million different ways we can build on top of that. Um, Roberto. Uh, yes. So, if uh, yeah, definitely a, a the value of a regenerated location should be in time better than than the value of a degenerated location. So, I think that could be something interesting there for welcoming investors to say like, hey, there is a a group of people here working at regenerating. So you you don't only get the real estate value of this, you get the regenerated estate value of this. So. I think there could be some opportunities there. Uh, I wanted to ask you, the question was about uh, uh, what spot in your diagram. Could you load it back up, please? And uh, particularly, how would a mutual credit system fit in, in, in the diagram that you wrote? And uh, another question is there was, um, there was one um, box that was not linked to anything and it was about uh, giving tokens to track contribution. That's it. Um, is maybe there where the diagram is? The mutual credits? All right, so a huge storm just came in, so I had to abandon post because I could not hear you at all. So <laughs> could you ask that question one more time? Okay, a few questions. Um, well, could you load back the diagram? Um, where, um, where could mutual credit fit in, in that diagram? I'll hear you. You are okay. muted. Thank you. Okay. Um, mutual credit would fit in the right side of that diagram. If anyone else wants to share their screen and bring up the diagram and then go to the right, we talk about mediums of exchange. I'd say mutual credit is one of those medium exchange functions that allows people to exchange with each other, create new currency, to then intermediate that exchange. Um, so I'd say that would be on the right side of your economy rather than on the left. Yeah, so if you want it to be kind of a stable form of value. Uh, because that's how uh, mutual credit kind of works. It is a stable function of value. It's not something that exists as a token that's increasing in value and something to you know grow in value. It's something that's stable as a medium exchange for communities. Um, it's maybe a complex answer. That's how I would see it, though, is I would use mutual credit for any functions that are happening on the right. And it's probably worth me adding that into this diagram as well, is having mutual credit currencies, which, by the way, are possible with the Rainbow Seeds contract that we already have. So communities can create a mutual credit currency and use the Seeds Light Wallet and stuff to use it. All this means is that people are then able to have a negative balance in their account. So you can have negative number of tokens. 
um, which means that you have the ability to then issue tokens into existence yourself and send them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, <clears throat> does that answer your question, Roberto? Uh, yes. And uh, is the contribution accounting part is not linked to anything? So I was wondering if there is an, a mislink or was purposely uh, unlinked. Yeah, so that's having no demand. That's you creating a token where you just mint it into existence for all the contributions. Um, but maybe there's no demand for this token. So maybe it's just a literal recognizing of donations to a cause. <laughs> you know, so you mint right. this token, you're creating supply for it, but there's no demand for the token, or go there's it's connected to nothing. Right. So what if we if so in that case, that? if you're making that token, I'd say legally there's no demand for this. And this is how so this is like how some DeFi projects get around regulations is they do exactly that. They create a token and say, this token is worthless. It's, there's no value in it. But simultaneously, the community believes that in the future, they are going to make this token attached to other things. There is going to be some value potentially for this token in the future. So there's some belief that that is going to be attached to some demand in the future at some time. But when they create the token and create it into existence, so this is where the law really cares when people are paying money or whatever for these tokens, they set it up just like this, where they say this token has no other purpose or function at all other than to account for the contributions to this project. Should this token become valuable in the future or not? Like, who knows? <laughs> Maybe people are buying these because they want to speculate on them, but treat them you know, no more or less interesting than baseball cards or whatever. So that's right. how people are kind of getting around SEC regulations right now is they're minting it and saying there's no value here. There's no demand for this token. That makes sense. Right. But you could actually get these tokens linked up to a contract that says if you do have them, then you get access. So you could still give um, give access, project access using these tokens, right? Or role access based on these tokens. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And you can remix these tokens, all the pathways, all you want to. So real time using governance, you can change how your token works to be any one of these other types of structures or forms. So when you launch your token, you don't have to say, okay, it's the token and it's this token forever. Of course, you can change what your token represents. Yeah, as actually, long as the people who are governing that token agree. Yeah, I have something that might help in, in that sense. I don't know in English what is the name, but in Spanish it's called internal agreements. So whatever you do in a like a private document or internal agreements can be also be like uh, valid and legit legitimate. And you can just kind of use that framework of the technology of tokens and just give the value by internal agreements. That will be as much as valid, valid as legal agreements because for most of the legal structures, internal agreements is still like a valid and legitimate legi legit agreement. Legit agreement. Should I have one model that I would like to share very Week, if possible, that it kind of relates what we are speaking in different in a different way, if it's possible. Um, maybe another time, because I feel like this might <laughs> be a deeper rabbit hole. So let's make sure Roberto is wrapped up. But yeah, if you slide right on the mirror board, it talks about cultural agreements being able to drive the value of a token. Yeah, exactly, internal agreements in a legal setting. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is what we're talking about is when we start off with a token, we can start redesigning what that token means. We can add new functions into it later. We can remove functions and we can do all of this through, you know, the governance process of our DAOs and communities. Um, but yeah, zoom out just a little bit and then slide right. Anyway, you guys can all explore this mirror board. Um, afterwards, Roberto, did that answer your question though? Yes, yes. Um, somehow I was very attracted by that thing in the empty space that, that, that one that didn't have it. And I think that because indeed the, there are opportunity of rebuilding something funny with that indeed. Um, so yeah, it did answer the question was wondering indeed if that would be linked to a mutual credit. So 
you know, like you minting tokens, but you have also listing how oh, this token needs to be given back at some point, right? So, or there's somebody that is in depth of that token. So there is a lot of things that's kind of like a jolly space, like it's everything can happen, right? And I, I like that part. Well, exactly. And when launching tokens, again, I don't quote me, I don't know the law entirely. I'm super amateur here, but it seems like that's what projects are doing to get around this is they're saying we're launching a token. We have no idea what this is going to be or become. This is how we're launching it. We're going to airdrop it on a community, or we're just going to give away the token, or we're going to mine it when anyone powers up their computer or whatever it is. They come up with all the interesting ways of how they give this token out and then say this token, we're just going to make up why it has value later. So that's kind of how they get around any of the investment problems is that people aren't buying into the security because there is no promise behind this token. It is very speculative up in the air, nothing. And EOS did this when they launched their token, um, or Block One rather, when they launched EOS. Is they launched a token and said, this token's worth absolutely nothing. And they had all the clauses of how it was not going to be worth anything. But then the community believed it might be worth something in the future. And the SEC gave them a pass and said, hey, the $4 billion that you raised, like, no problem. Um, so the SEC kind of actually nodded off and gave approval to their model that said that if you launched a token, then it has no value when you launch it, but then it has value later. Even if it very much looks like a security later, that's fine. <laughs> and they raised $4 billion. So anyway, okay, so it's, it's a deeper landscape. Uh, just to be precise, I think the interest for me was more about the fact that you could say, oh, you watered the plants and oh, you clean up the pool or oh, you, you did the farming, right? So not one token that looks the same, but all this serious or non-fungible uh, kind of action that tracks the contribution, which then you can bundle together to give access. So like a, a sort of like a, um, yeah, NFTs kind of like economy built on top of from your NFTs. So I wanted to be precise that not interested in just a token that is worth nothing, but just a token that is worth the information that is contained, right? Yeah. Oof. Um, all right, I'm going to riff on that because that one's one more. <laughs> I think that's incredible. And that's opening up a whole other world of possibility here where it becomes very difficult for old systems to try to quantify. <laughs> Meaning when some like a tax authority, for example, comes around to your community and wants to levy a tax on your economic interactions, if everything is bundled up in these kind of like very hard to quantify NFTs, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to fit that into current tax legislation in order to know how much to tax your economic activity. But if your economic activity is in a token that looks like a fiat dollar and people are exchanging it and buying goods and services in your community the same way other economies work, and they're able to show up and be like, hey, you guys are giving gifts and you know we can actually see the taxable value in your community a lot easier. And this isn't always the way of thinking about it. I'm just talking about this because legal is coming up next. So this is a way of like thinking about how we're designing our economies from a legal perspective. But you know, when you make them incompatible with the framework of the old systems, then they aren't able to kind of just incorporate them into theirs. So that's where I think NFTs create a whole new world of possibility is if we're packaging up each individual action and giving it an NFT, it becomes very hard again to quantify like the actual exchange of goods and services. Maybe, you know, depending on how we do it. Or it becomes more easy if that's what we're trying to achieve as a community. So anyway, I say all of this because of the, the legal section that is coming up. So um, next week, we're going to talk about actually launching a do for those who want to do it. And then the weeks after that, we're opening up into the legal conversation and how we're designing our tokens from that legal perspective. Um, so before we dive into all of that, does anyone else have any other questions about tokenomics today? Or any other feedback from anything we've talked about so far? I have a question, but I do, do want to say that we have uh, like a very integral proposal how to manage uh, this kind of contributions in time different capitals and how to also manage <clears throat> from a more let's say uh, social perspective not just like uh, technology and crypto world and all this but but in a way that we really structure something that is fair and and 
yeah, um, <laughs> human, humane, and well, at some point we can share with much more time and calm. I can leave the link just if you want to take a look for what we have. Yeah, awesome. I believe that's probably what most of us are here to do, is to design new types of civilization systems that are much more beautiful and joyful to be a part of. And in order to be that, I think they do have to be more equitable. Um, and then that is kind of the foundation of tokenomics, always bringing it back to that, is that is how we make it explicit that it is equitable. So again, that's why we do the contribution accounting so that we're seeing all the contributions. We're being fair in our communities. We're not exploiting people and not recognizing them. You know, because that's kind of how our old economies operate is they, you know, have so much that's not part of their purview. And then even within it, it's based off of exploitation. So they have the concept of profit and driving profit to take as much value from other people. And there's kind of a game that like who can drive the most capital without even having to recognize it. So rather than our economies being like, wow, mothers are so incredibly valuable to our societies, let's figure out a way to make them an integral foundational part of our economic system. So that the unit of playing a mother is something that we fundamentally reward because that's hugely important for the success of humanity. Um, instead, we actually say, oh, well, we don't, mothers don't have a job, so that's fine. You know, well, let's just ignore them. <laughs> you know, and it's not even a, it's not even considered in our economic system, the role of motherhood, right? You know, like one of the most vital roles and of course fatherhood as well but um so i'm saying as we go about designing our economies if we start it from that lens that we talked about today where you're like what are we actually trying to accomplish what are our needs making that really explicit then things like rewarding fatherhood and motherhood become fundamental because you see your need for self-expression and growth is directly related to how you are raised and how we're raising the next generation. So if you wanna have any hope of meeting that, like this is how we can start supporting that process, right? So anyway, that's what I'm saying is you start off with what are our needs and then you wanna go through the process of what is everything that we have? Because a lot of communities thinks that, again, that they need to wait until they have money before they start acting to coordinate to meet their needs. This is a way of helping us unlock all the potential that we already have within our community that if we start coordinating well, we can start doing that today. And maybe we don't even need to raise any money, right? Um, so that's kind of the step-by-step the -step process. And then you introduce tokens and then you start designing the value into the tokens. And then of course the token journey is one that evolves forever and changes as your community changes. Um, Anders, you got your hand up. You're muted. Everybody doesn't necessarily have to have their own um, access token. Like the beautiful thing about the access token is that like if we're aligned in all these different levels and some of us might have various different like models built out for different access tokens, it becomes really fun when we can uh, share those access tokens among each other. And, and, and if somebody owns access tokens to here, now they can go to all of these other members, you know, to utilize those access tokens to, to share more of all these things that don't actually cost us any money, you know, but it provides a beautiful experience. So excited about that. Well, yes, exactly that is. And that's why I keep kind of pushing the access token model <laughs> is that if all of our communities did that, then we have one global network that is one civilization where your contributions to this community here are just as good as contributing to the community on the other side of the globe. And tokens is kind of how we intermediate that, right? Um, so I think it's really beautiful that every project, it seems like, especially all the ones of the 13, we've all kind of envisioned our projects as being something that's meant to be repl replicable and scalable and kind of like bounce around the world as well. But I think we are doing that already. If we design our projects and we make them interoperable, then we just built that diverse, you know, interoperable network of eco villages that we kind of dreamed about. So maybe it doesn't have to come like the traditional way that we envisioned it through capitalism, which is like, well, you start your brand and then you push your brand out there to the rest of the world. Maybe instead it's like we create our brand that's very particular to our brand because it's beautiful and we love it. And then we integrate with all the other brands that are out there. And of course they can replicate and we can multiply, but the main growth isn't of our particular brand kind of going out there in a linear fashion. Instead, it's all of the brands kind of coming together and becoming interoperable. 
And if we have all of these access tokens to do that, then of course that's what makes it all possible and easy. But then building on top of that, and I think even more valuable is if we're using similar organization and coordination tools. So again, like badges that you earn in one community are valuable in another one. So you gotta kind of take your accolades with you in a sense you know, your role history, and then the role format is very similar. So when you show up to a new community, you don't have to completely learn an entirely different coordination language. Like, yes, there's gonna be differences from community to community, but if we're using, again, that same like ontological framework for how we coordinate, then it'll be a lot easier from jumping from one to the next. And that's why we want, you know, very similar patterns with like our game guides, for example is if we all follow a similar process for structuring our game guide, then again, it becomes a lot easier for you to go from one community to the next and understand their differences. So that's kind of why I want our alliance process itself to be this idea of integrating into the shared game that we're creating. So all of the templates I'm building for helping coordinate the season, like look at them from the lens of us building a shared template. You know, I'm kind of providing a skeleton maybe, but we can re-engineer that skeleton. But we want to design a shared template that we start bringing out there and that we integrate all of our wisdom from all of our communities and projects with, because that's what's going to help us, you know, scale our coordination, help others join our network and, you know, be able to grow this thing, right? Um, thoughts. Anyway, that was a lot of thoughts. Does anyone else have any thoughts or anything else they'd like to share? All right, I want to call on one then. I want to say, Tina, is this helping? Is this making sense? What questions might you be having? Okay, maybe not Tina. Maybe she's not there. I'll pass it to Sam. Also, maybe on listening mode. All right. I'm not gonna call out on people unless anyone's got something that they wanna share for today. You can also sit in silence until an inspired question comes. Is there a group? You're doing great. Is there any working group that that is developing this, this harvesting all this collective intelligence for integral diverse ecosystems? Um, that's what I am currently doing as facilitating this week by week process. Jillian is joining me and she'll be helping us design a framework. I know Jamaica was really interested in doing that. And I think she'll be coming back to join that. So that's, it's not really a working group for kind of amorphously coordinating to make this happen. Um, but also season one is about uncovering these patterns too. So you guys are all kind of part of a little bit of a chaotic process, um, but that's because we're letting it kind of unfold and designing what that process will look like. So, you know, the working group of uncovering this is literally this call each week, um, but we're just making sure that it serves the double function of helping us progress our own projects and towards our own goals, right? Um, so it's kind of folding all of that in at the same time, if you will. Okay, and well, for anyone that is interested, and we are. <laughs> and for anyone who's watching this, then just a plug here, uh, we do have a standing quest in the Regen Civics do for helping um, write up the meeting notes and track what's happening in these calls. So if you're following any of these and you're excited about that, just feel free to start putting those up and you can earn some tokens for you know, enhancing your learning journey. Anyway, that's me plugging to people who might watch this. Any other thoughts or questions on any of this before we close for today? Well, I would invite for uh, an open group to collaborate on this because we're really focused on this right now, like for a couple of years, and we we'll have to, we we feel we can uh, manifest something together soon, even in a very simple well, and ludic way. Then yeah, let's get a working group started. If you go into the Region Civics Discord and you put in there into the working groups channel mm -hmm. that you would like to start a working group to start weaving this stuff together, then share that there and share any materials that might help people understand where you've come so far in that journey and help them get on the same page. And then yeah, let's launch a working group. And if anyone's interested in joining that, just come to the Region Civics Discord, head to the working group channel, you'll see that. 
That also applies for anyone else wanting to launch a working group. So if your project is honing in on one particular problem, that problem is shared by other projects. Start a working group with it and start leveraging some of the intellectual capital that's in this community, right? And there's a lot that's just not being called into action. So if your project has a challenge that you're working on, set up a working group and start hosting the sessions and you know, solve it. Um, yeah, awesome. So we went a little bit over, but I think we're gonna be extending these out to like an hour 15, an hour 30. Um, by for our average length to be able to cover everything we want to cover in this. But anyway, that's all I have for today. I can, everyone can unmute and we could say goodbye or whatever noises we want to make. Unless anyone else has anything else they want to add. Thank you, Raiki. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lucian. Love the glasses. Yeah. Nice to meet the children. Thank you, Thanks for the awesome questions, Roberto. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jillian, if you want to stick around. <laughs>